Lord God, thank you for giving us this opportunity to study your word today. Bless us through it. Send your Holy Spirit that we grow in our understanding of you and our relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So uh, on, on less, in lesson one, we you know talk about who is God. We talk about the natural knowledge and the revealed knowledge of God. How, you know, just looking around at nature, you can see something's out there. Our conscience tells us we we've messed up. Um, the uh, and then the revealed knowledge where God describes for us who exactly He is and, and what He's done for us. And then we have looked at at uh, a list of attributes about God, uh, you know, holy and and uh, eternal and every you know all omnipresent, all powerful, all of that. Uh, the last one on the top of page six, God is love. Uh, Victor, you want to read First John four eight? Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Okay. Um, you know, we uh, in, in, at the bottom of page five, we had talked about, you know, God being just and punishing sin and, and also um, loving and forgiving. Um, everything he does is, is love, right? You know, we, we might know love or feel love or have love, but God is love. Everything he does, even punishing sin. Uh, all of it is, is love, you know, and so the question will come up a few times during the course of, of these lessons. People ask the question all the time, why does God blink, whatever, whatever it is? Last night, someone asked, why does God let bad things happen if he's, if he's so good? Um, and, you know, the, the first answer is always, well, because he loves us, because uh, that's who he is, that's what he does. And then sometimes it takes a little bit to figure out how whatever that is shows love and as we get into lesson two we'll get a good example of that uh, so we'll talk about that some more but but god is love uh, and, and then uh in the next part it talks about the trinity right our god is a triune god um triune trinity those words aren't actually in the bible uh, but they are words that believers have been using for thousands of years to describe what the bible says about god the Bible says there is only one God. Passage after passage, you know, like this one. Hero, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You know, he says, I am the only God, there is no other. You know, he, he won't share his glory. One God, one God, one God, all over the place in Scripture. But then you also see God described as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, triune, real literally means three in one. Tri, like a tricycle, three, yun, like a unicycle, one. So the three in one God. So we believe in one God. We believe in three persons of the, the Godhead. So, you know, in Matthew 28, Lisa, do you want to read that one? You're on mute. I don't know if you're trying to talk or not. Can you hear me now? Now I can hear you. Yep, yep. Okay. So where was we at? I'm sorry. So on page six, Matthew 28, 19. Oh, there we are. Therefore go and make dis disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost Spirit. Okay. So three of them named. In Second Corinthians, it talks about the blessing, you know, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, love of God, fellowship of the Spirit. And in Matthew 3, that's uh, when Jesus was baptized. You know, John the Baptist is baptized in the Jordan River. Uh, Jesus comes up and says, I want you to baptize me. John says, well, you don't, you don't need it. This is a baptism of repentance. Uh, and, and he says, well, I'm doing it to fulfill all righteousness. So John goes ahead and baptizes him. And then, then this happens. It says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. So you have Jesus standing there in the water, the spirit descending in the form of a dove, the, the, the father speaking from heaven, this is my son. Um, so you see the three distinct persons of the Trinity. There's that, that diagram there that doesn't necessarily make it make sense, but does describe what scripture says, right? So the father is not the son. You know, think of the son praying to his father, the father sent the son. The son is not the spirit, you know, the Spirit strengthened the Son. The, the Son sent the Spirit on Pentecost. 
And the Father is not the Spirit, but the Father is God. The Son is God. The Spirit is God, and not just part of God, but the Bible describes each of them as completely God. So, you know, in, in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lived in bodily form, the Colossians says. Uh, so the, the math on this is one plus one plus one equals one. And our minds say, no, 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 wait a second, but there's three. Um, and I mean, ultimately, it's probably a good thing that we don't understand everything about God. If I could understand everything about God, he he wouldn't be much of a God. He's um, he, He'd be one of us. But thankfully, he's much bigger than us, more than we could ever uh, understand. Um, so, yeah, any questions on the Trinity? Yeah. Okay, I've got a couple of, uh, or three true or false questions on there. What do you think about those? First one, there are three distinct persons in the Trinity. Three distinct persons in the Trinity. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, number two, there are three separate gods. False. No, you know, while the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, yet there's only one God. How about number three? The Father existed before the Son and the Spirit. True. Okay, this is the one that that always trips people up because, um, you know, I, I think we think about it. And we think about, you know, Jesus was born, and for us, that's a beginning, right? Um, but the Bible does talk about how how the Son of God um, was always there. Uh, throughout all eternity. And, and you think about at the first part of the lesson, God does not change. And if God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he's always Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. At a point in time, the Son took flesh, but but he was always there. You know, John writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and then a few verses later, he says, and that Word became flesh. Um, so Jesus always has been, but he took a hu human flesh at a point in time. We'll talk about that more in, in lesson uh, three. Um, but, but yeah, the, there was not a time when the triune God wasn't the triune God because God doesn't change. So, so yeah, that one was kind of a trick question. Uh, that, that one's false there. Uh, the bold statement there is just, uh, I, I kind of described that, you know, this is something that we accept by faith because um, this is what God's word says. My mind can't fully comprehend it, um, but again, I'm glad that God's bigger than I can comprehend. Uh, and, and I put that last passage on there just because I, I think so often we think of Jesus as just the baby born in Bethlehem and the guy who died on the cross. I mean, it's good that we think of those things because those are important things, but he is true God from all eternity, and, and this is a, a picture of, of the glory of Jesus when when John, uh, the Apostle John, was in exile, right? He had been preaching Christ and he had been punished for that. He was in exile on the island of Patmos and, and Christians were being persecuted and killed. It looked like uh, God's church was, was in trouble. Um, but Jesus appears to John and says, I want you to write this down. I'm going to show you something um, that, uh, show you what's really going on, you know, in the spiritual realm. I'm going to give you a glimpse of heaven. And so, so John gets this vision where he gets to see heaven. And, and in this vision at the beginning, he sees Jesus there. Uh, Victor, you want to read Revelation 1? Yep. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were like wool as white as snow, and his eyes were blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at, I fell at his feet, though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Okay. So notice how, you know, John sees Jesus, and 
And he doesn't really even have the words to, to exactly explain it. Everything's like this and like that, right? You know, it's, it, it's white like wool, eyes like blazing fire, uh, feet like bronze. Um, you know, this, this amazing picture of power, you know, the, the sword, the power from his mouth, his, his voice like the, the, the uh, rushing water. Um, he sees this power and what does he do? He does what is natural. If we come into the presence of, of something with that much power, we fall on our face. You know, I, I'm in trouble, right? Um, but then notice what Jesus does. Puts his hand on his shoulder and says, it, it's me. The one who loved you that much. I'm the one with all this power. Um, it's going to be okay. Yeah. I always uh, think about you know being seeing something that powerful can have one of two reactions in us, right? Um, in college, I played football, uh, not not at you know one of these D1 schools where you have just monsters on the field, but I, I played at a it was actually the smallest school in the country that had a team, a Division Three, where guys who looked like me could actually play football. Um, but there was one guy on our team who was 6'7", 275. His name was his nickname was Moose. Uh, he ran a 4740. He could lift more weights than anyone I've ever seen. He was a beast. He could have gone anywhere to play football, but he wanted to be a pastor, and so he he went to the school I was going to and. And uh, you see a guy like that on a football field, you're going to have one of two reactions. It's either, uh-oh, or this is awesome. Um, what's the difference? You know, it depends, is he on my team or am I lining up against him, right? In the game, when he was right next to me on the line, I was tight end, he was the tackle. That was a beautiful thing to have someone that big there. Um, but when I had to go against him in practice and blocking drills and stuff, that that wasn't so fun. Um, you know, so you think of this, here's the one with real power uh, and he's the one saying, hey, I'm on your side. Uh, so that's that's our lesson one on God. And any questions there, Lisa? No. Okay. And I still don't uh, see Vicki. You wanna run check the parking lot? I know last week you said she had a hard time using the door. Um, but uh, yeah, we can roll into to lesson two here. Um, in lesson two, we talk about sin and grace. Um, so our, our problem and how God fixes it, right? Uh, and this lesson has actually grown because the same question came up every time. We used to start with uh, the uh, um, story of the first fall into sin. And, you know, the devil tempting Eve and, and the question always came up, well, where did the devil come from? Um, and so I, I figured I'll add some passages so we can, we can answer that question. And so we start with a little description of angels. Uh, and maybe just to get our, our thoughts going, we'll, we'll do a, a couple of true or falses. First one, true or false, angels are people who died and went to heaven and now take care of their living family. What do you think sure. there? Hello. Hello. Hi, Pastor. How you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? Doing well. Doing well. So we finished lesson one, and we're just starting to lesson two. So if you want to stick around afterward, maybe Vicar can go over that last page of lesson one with you, so that you don't you don't miss that. Okay. So all right. So yeah. So we're on we're on lesson two, and we're starting with a, a true or false question. True or false, angels are people who died and went to heaven and now take care of their living family. What do you think? False. Okay. Uh, unless you watch the movies, right? If, if you watch Hollywood enough, um, they'll try to tell you that. But, you know, the Bible describes the angels as separate beings from us. Uh, and in fact, the angels are were made to serve us. Uh, so it's way better to, to be a human than, than an angel, you know, the uh, um, that old movie uh, uh, with Jimmy Stewart, the Christmas one. Um, I always get the, the two mixed up here. Life. Wonderful Life, that's the one, yeah. Um, where, you know, when when the bell rings, the angel gets its wings, that, that thing. Well, no, not really. Uh, you know, the angels were created as they were, uh, were created uh, um, separate. How about, how about this one? True or false? Angels can take various forms. 
True. Yeah, absolutely. We see them sometimes in the Bible as these powerful creatures with the, the, the wings and the eyes all around and glowing like fire. And, and, and other times they look like humans. Um, you know, when, when uh, the angels went to Sodom and Gomorrah, the, the people of the town thought they were guys. Um, so, so yeah. Uh, so what does the Bible say about the angels? Um, well, God created them. He created them during the first six days of creation. Um, Vicki, you want to read uh, Exodus 20? Um, well, in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Notice he doesn't specifically mention angels, but he says everything in heaven and on earth uh, he made during those days. And in Colossians 1, talking about the creation, uh, Paul talks about how, how uh, Jesus was involved in all of it. By him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things created by him and for him. So, so God created those angels. He created them as perfect beings. Vicar, are you on Genesis 1? God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth of day. Yeah, so very good. Um, nothing wrong with it. Lisa, are you on Hebrews 1, 14? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. Okay, so a couple of things you notice in there. They're spirits, right? God is spirit. He doesn't have a physical form, but he can take visible appearances. Same thing with the angels. They're spirit. Uh, they don't necessarily have a permanent physical form, but they take them to appear to us, to interact, uh, to, to communicate, etc. cetera. Um, and number four, he created them as powerful, innumerable servants of God and his people. Uh, you know, Psalm 103, you've got, you know, praise the Lord, you as angels, you mighty ones, who do his bidding, and then later, who do his will. Uh, they're servants of God. Uh, they're innumerable, Revelation 5. Uh, this is, you know, same book, Revelation, where John gets the, the glimpse of heaven, and he sees the angels, thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000. In other words, just this, this huge, innumerable number um, in, in the Greek the largest number you can say in one word is 10,000 kilo. After that, it's, you know, 10, 10, you got to do multiplication in how they talk about it. So, so this is like us saying, you know, billions and zillions or whatever. Um, Hebrews 1, we read. How about Psalm 91? Um, let's see. I think I went out of order. So Vicar just read, right? So we'll go Vicky and we'll get back in order. Psalm 91. Yep. Well, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Okay, so true or false, we have guardian angels. True. True. Yeah, we, we don't know if there's one assigned for each person. We don't know if, you know, maybe I need a couple hundred, you know, depending on what <laughs> trouble I get into. Or, or maybe they play zone, you know, one angel covers a bunch. But one way or another, God sent them to guard us, to, to take care of us. Um, so any questions on angels? Um, in general. No. Then we get into the, the reason I brought up the angels because the devil. The devil is a fallen angel. Uh, we don't know exactly what the sin of the devil was, what the rebellion was. We get a couple of comments about it, but, but no real details. It's one of those places in scripture where uh, um, it might be interesting to know a little bit more, but but, well, God tells us what he tells us for our good, what we need to know. And that's, uh, um, that's, excuse me, that obviously didn't include a whole lot of details about the angels. Um, you know, there's a passage in Jude that talks about how, how the devil didn't keep his position of authority. So, you know, almost sounds like he, you know, he, he didn't want to be under someone, didn't want to, didn't want to have to listen to God um, but 2 Peter 2, 4 uh, talks about it, you know, kind of mentions it. So, Lisa, you want that one, 2 Peter 2, 4? For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy, dangerous to be held for judgment. Okay. They sinned. He didn't spare them. Sent them to hell. Um, puts them in 
dungeons, you know, that these holding uh, place, if you call it a place, you know, for spirits. But but uh, but then at the same time, the Bible also talks about how God does allow Satan and and the evil angels to roam the earth to to tempt us, to test us. Um, and uh, you know, John eight forty four. If you want that one, this is. This is Jesus talking to some people who were who were uh, uh, opposing him, and he compares them to the devil, and he gives some description of the devil there. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Okay, so a murderer, a liar. Um, and dangerous to us, First Peter 5. You have to let that one be. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. Okay. Um, you know, the, this prowling lion looking for someone to devour it. If there were a, a lion, a, a roaring lion in this room, um, I'm pretty certain none of us would want to stay in this room, right? We'd get as far away as quickly as possible. Um, but God uses that picture to describe the devil and his temptations. Um, how often don't we don't we kind of look at the line and say, okay, there's the line. I'm not supposed to do that. But I'll get as close as I as I can to that line without going over. No, it should be we're supposed to be running the other way. Um, so you've got the, the devil being dangerous, uh, and then the devil tempted Adam and Eve to sin by breaking God's law. Um, they let him get close, right? Um, and the first passage there, First John 3, uh, it, it just, you know, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness, lawlessness of just defining what sin is. It's breaking God's law. Uh, in Genesis 3, then, we have this conversation that goes on, because God had created Adam and Eve. And he gave them everything. It says he gave them this beautiful garden with trees producing fruit all over the place. And, and he said, it's all for you to eat. Uh, it's all for you to enjoy. But he said one rule, just don't eat from this one tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You've got everything you could ever want. Just don't eat from this one. Um, and, and uh, you know, the wages of sin is death, all of that. The devil comes up to Eve and says, hey, you should eat from this tree. And, and uh, she says, no, no, I, I don't want to do that. God told us not to. And he said, if we do, we're going to die. Uh, and, and then this is the conversation. Vicar, you want to read that? You will not surely die, the, ser the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate her. Okay. Well, look at that temptation. What, what was really Satan's temptation? What's his first temptation, really? He, he told her that she would be like God. Okay. So he tries to appeal to, um, hey, who are you? Right? You're going to be like God. And, and so, so what's he implying? Um, right now, you're not, right? Right now, you don't know good and evil. I suppose even before that, what's he doing with, with the first statement? You will not surely die. God said you're going to die. Satan says, no, you won't. He's calling God a liar, right? And, and, and then he, he goes on, and, and, and then he gets into that, um, oh, God's holding on at you. Now, was it good for them to know good things? Absolutely, right? Uh, is it good for us to have to experience bad things? No, it would be better not to have to experience bad things, right? Then you wouldn't appreciate the good. Well, <laughs> then we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. You think ahead of us here. But I mean, just in general, good is better than bad, right? And God wanted to give them everything good. And so, no, he didn't have them experience bad things yet. Um, is that because God didn't love them? No, it, it was because God was doing what was best for them. But Satan convinced them 
like he tries to do with us, that no, God does want what's best for you. You know, God's God's rules are keeping you from something. Um, mom and dad say, no, you can't go to that party, teenager, uh, because I know what's happening at that party. Oh, mom and dad, it's because you don't love me. It's because you hate me because you're trying to keep me from something fun. No, it's because we want you to have something better, right? Um, God has good for them, and, and Satan makes evil sound good. Um, now, was he right? They, did, they didn't know good and evil, uh, but he was lying in that it wasn't going to be good for them to know this, and they wouldn't be like God. Um, and then, of course, you know, she saw it, and, and uh, well, if I'm going to gain something through this, I might as well do it. And he, yeah, Adam's right there. He, uh, she gives it to him. He eats. Um, and then Romans 5.12 talks about what that did to us. Uh, who read the last vicar did? So, Vicki? Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through one man, and in this way, death came to all men, because all sinned. Okay. So they sinned, and now we're born in sin. They, 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 uh, they handed that down. Any questions on that temptation? Anything you want to dig into there? I'll ask you one then. Why did God put the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden? Because he wanted to. Because he wanted to. Did he know what would happen? Did he know that they were going to sin? Okay. He gave us a choice. Yeah. He knows all, right? So he knew exactly what was going to happen. Um, so, so why then would he put it there knowing that we're going to mess up? Free will. Yeah, okay. Free will. free will. Gave it gave us that choice. Um, and why is that so important? Because I don't know, because we make bad choices. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so knowing we make bad choices, wouldn't it be better for him to just say, no, nope, <laughs> I'm not even going to give you that option? Um, obviously the answer is no, because God did it, so it's good, right? But uh, uh, <clears throat> think of why we were created. When, when God created everything else, he said, let there be, let there be, let there be. When he created us, he says, let's make man in our own image, in our own likeness. Uh, and, and then he created Adam and he said, ah, it's not good yet. It's not good for the man to be alone. I'm going to make, I'm going to make a partner there. I'm going to make a helper suitable for him. Um, and, and then he, you know, puts Adam in the deep sleep, takes his rib, creates Eve, um, brings her to him. He created us for relationship. Relationship with one another and relationship with him. Every, everything else is described as servant, right? The, the ministering spirit sent to serve. Um, but, but us, he created to, to have a relationship with him. And, and God is love. So, so in order for us to have a relationship, we have to be able to, to love. Um, and I've used this illustration every time I've taught this since my son was five, and he's 26 now. He's 25 now. Um, so this is a 20-year-old illustration. But but uh, I was teaching a day when when earlier in that day, my son had come home from kindergarten, and he had gotten off the bus. And at the time, we didn't have any church property. The, the uh, um, church office was my lower level of a split foyer, right? So uh, my basement. So I'm down there in my office. He comes in through the garage, opens the, the door. Uh, he sees me in, in my office, and I'm going to put two scenarios in there. Scenario one, he opens the door. We see each other. I say, Andrew, you get in here right now and give me a hug. Tell me you love me. Otherwise, you're going to bed without any dinner. I'm taking away all your toys, and you don't get a birthday this year. So he comes up and says, I love you, and gives me a hug. Or scenario two, he walks in the door. I don't even see him. He runs in, gives me a hug, and tells me he loves me. Uh, which one is real? Which one is love? Which one is relationship? I mean, obviously the second one. Right? And thankfully, that's what happened. Uh, you know, so so uh, um, you know, but but if he would have just done it because he had to and had no choice, it it wouldn't have been relationship, right? God wants a relationship with us. And so God gave them that tree for them to have an opportunity to love him. Um, 
everything else they would be doing would be only for themselves. That's not love. Um, but the one command God gives them, don't eat from this tree. And so he, so he, uh, um, did you see that? Yes. I did a thumbs up and a little thing popped up on the screen. I'm sorry, I got distracted by that there. Oh, <laughs> oh no, it's not good to do it. Good time. <laughs> I saw it. Wow. <laughs> that was amazing. Okay, what was that talking about now? I'm sorry, I just distracted us. But yeah, so that love that uh, um, Martin Luther wrote a sermon on this text one time, and and he uh, had a great line in there. He said, that tree was their altar and their temple. So think of what the altar and the temple were for the people of Israel. That was where they worshiped God. That's where they told God, you are worth something to us. Um, and, and so that tree was Adam and Eve's opportunity to say, we love you, God. We could eat from that tree, but we're not going to because, um, because God said so. And I want to do what God says. Um, so he gave them the chance to love, even knowing how much it was going to cost him. Uh, because they sinned, they brought sin into the world, and he would have to do something to fix sin. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but first, the consequences of sin. God, after they, they sin, God comes walking in the garden, and, and uh, instead of hanging out with him, they go and hide. God calls out to them. He, he comes and finds them and, and basically says, hey, you can't hide. What's going on? Tell me what's going on. They didn't want to say anything. He told them what they had done. Um, and then he said, okay, here are the consequences. Uh, women will have pain in childbirth. This is one of the things that sin brings into the world. I don't, I don't know what it would have been like otherwise, but I do believe, even though I've never given birth, I do believe it's painful <laughs> just seeing my wife go through it, right? Um, uh, people will sow and reap by the sweat of the brow. Work will be work. It won't always be easy. It won't always be fun. Adam and Eve had to leave the garden, that place where, where everything was wonderful, but, but also the place where the tree of life was, where if they eat of it, they live forever. God didn't want that. He didn't want them to live forever in that broken relationship. He wanted to let them live forever in a fixed relationship. Uh, people have to die. That's the, the wages of sin. And Adam and Eve lost the image of God. I think we hear that term image of God and we think about what something looks like. But of course, God is spirit, so he doesn't have a visible image. His image is that perfection, that holiness. And us being in Him, his image means that, that, that we are in that perfect relationship with the perfect God that we can't be if we have sin. Um, and, and so then the future consequences, when Adam and Eve had kids, they weren't in the image of God. They were in their image. Um, in Genesis 5, you know, just talks about when, when Adam and Eve had, had Seth, you know, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image. Um, you know, so so our children, well, and after us. yeah, exactly. An apple tree produces apples, an orange tree produces oranges, sinners produce sinners. Um, and so we talk about original sin or inherited sin. As an important teaching of scripture. Let's read Psalm 51 5. Who read last? Okay, so Lisa, your turn. Top of page nine. 51 5. Surely mm -hmm. I was, huh? Yes. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Okay. Um, from, from birth, from conception. In John 3, Jesus says, flesh gives birth to flesh, right? A sinful human gives birth to a sinful human, which is why the spirit has to give birth to, to that new life in us. Um, the man was lost. God came with the promise. As soon as he, he talked about those curses, um, he turned to, to Satan and told him, I will put enmity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, enmity is that, that hostility. He's breaking mm -hmm. a relationship. Instead of instead of Eve, you know, because Adam and Eve had been on God's side, and Satan says, "No, no, no, no you don't want you, you know, God's holding out on you. You want to come to my side." God says, "I'm breaking that relationship. Uh, I'm putting enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, Eve, and between your offspring, so any unbelievers that that would come after you, and and hers. Uh, so really, the human race. And then he talks about one specific offspring." 
Uh, one specific seed is really the word. He will crush your head, Satan, and you will strike his heel. So God's promising a descendant of Eve to crush Satan's power. And Satan would hurt him. Um, of course, the Bible goes on and explains exactly who that is. It was the one who was going to be born of a virgin, the one who would be born in Bethlehem, the one who, who would be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. You know, prophecy after prophecy in the Old Testament added to this picture uh, that was fulfilled in Jesus. Um, so this is that, that promise of grace. We sin. God said, I'm going to fix that. Uh, any questions on sin and grace? So I, I do have a question. Okay. And so it says the law. Are they talking about the Ten Commandments law? Uh, in which passage are you looking at? First John three four. Um, Everyone yeah. who sins. Oh, breaks, breaks the law. Okay. Yeah. So that word law is used in several different ways in scripture. Sometimes it's used to describe the, the natural law um, that's written on everybody's heart, like we talked about in the first lesson that, you know, that our conscience is testified to. So God's overarching will for all people of all times, written in our hearts, and then also written in the Bible, summarized in the Ten Commandments, right? Um, sometimes it talks about all of God's revelation to us in the Bible. So like, Psalm 119, you know, Lord, I love your law. You know, I meditate on it day and night. That's a, a, a word for the Bible, right? Um, in fact, the the first five books of the Bible, so before the prophets, you know, the prophets talked about them as the Torah. The, the Jews called those first five books the Torah, which is the word for law. Um, and of course, in those, there's also gospel. And so sometimes then the 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 term law is used to describe the, the message of this is what God demands, this is the punishment for it, uh, that, and then sometimes it's used for the whole thing. Here, we're talking about this is this is God's will, these are his set of commands, um, you know, summarized in the Ten Commandments, and, and we have a whole lesson on, on that, on, on the Ten Commandments and the law. Um, but yeah, good question, because depending on the context, that word can can have various, you know, a, a narrow meaning and a broader meaning as well. Um, and, and actually, the rest of this lesson, then we get into describing the law and the gospel as those two messages of Scripture. Because I, um, Jesus did away with the law, right? So he, he fulfilled the law. Yep. Okay. Um, yep. Uh, so the, the Old Testament requirements for the people of Israel are no longer binding on us. Uh, you know, because he said he he fulfilled the Sabbath rest and he fulfilled the sacrifice and he fulfilled all those things. Those things were a shadow pointing ahead to him. But then the Bible also talks about the law as God's moral law in general. You know, and Jesus, even though he fulfilled the law, he's the one who said, well, you've heard it was said, don't murder. I tell you, don't even look at one of us. But, you know, so he he was giving law in that sense, even though that Old Testament uh, corpus of of specific requirements for the people of Israel, you know, about, you know, Sabbath and, and uh, uh, certain festivals and sacrifices and all of that, that was fulfilled. Does that make sense? Yeah. So okay. in essence, it deals with morality. Yes, in, in, the, in the wide sense. Yep, yep. And so now we're going to uh, talk about the law and the gospel, so the law in the narrow sense looking at God's specific commands for us that apply to all people of all time. What God says is right and wrong. Not the list of requirements for the Old Testament people of Israel, since God was not just their God, he was also their government. Uh, he's given us governments that he says he gives them the authority and they, they uh, rule with, with his authority. Um, and we'll we'll talk about that. We got a lesson on that too coming up. Um, but uh, yeah, so now we're talking about the law and the gospel as the two key messages of scripture. Uh, and so the verdict of the law, 
So this is uh, in Romans 3. I'll read this one because I'm going to break it up a little bit. Uh, in the letter to the Romans, Paul's writing to a group of people that he uh, didn't start this congregation. A, a lot of the, the uh, letters in the New Testament were written by Paul. So 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, uh, those, those all written by Paul to um, congregations that he started or to individuals that he had trained. Um, and this one, though, and, and those are usually in response to something that he hears. Well, I hear that you're dealing with this issue. Let me explain that for you. Romans, he's planning on visiting them, but he, he hasn't been able to yet. Um, and so he gives them a letter basically saying, this is how salvation works. And he goes from front to back. It's 16 chapters. The first two and a half chapters are all Paul hammering us with the law. I mean, he starts with it's, hi, I'm Paul. I'm writing to you believers in Rome. God's awesome. Now let me tell you some stuff. And, and, and then so all the rest of chapter one, then all of chapter two, the first half of chapter three is Paul just hammering them over the head. Uh, you know, you sin in this way, we sin in that way, you sin in this way, uh, Jews sin, Gentiles sin, old people sin, young people sin, God hates sin, this sin leads to that sin, that sin leads to this sin, this sin leads to that sin, and, and uh, just on and on and on, sin's bad, God hates sin, punishment for sin, and, and, and I'm saying it like this to kind of give you the, the picture, he just keeps going. And you're like, okay, Paul, we get it. But he just keeps going. Sin is bad, and this sin, and that sin, and that sin. And then he gets to chapter 3, and he kind of sums it up. After he's been going for two chapters, he says, what shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. And then he starts quoting the Old Testament. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God, all have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of viper is on their lips. And we're like, okay, Paul, we get it. The, the Old Testament agrees with what you've been saying, but he keeps going. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Another one, their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. In the way of peace, they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. So that's us, right? We're all born under law. We're, we're humans. And then he gives the reason. So that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. I don't think that's the reason most people think of when they think of God's law. You know, if you asked 100 people on the street, why do you think God gave the Ten Commandments? Why do you think God gave the law? I have a feeling just about everyone is going to give you some version of the answer, well, so that we would know what he wanted, right? So that we would know how we could please him, so that we wouldn't do the bad things, so that we would do the good things. And notice that's not what Paul says the reason is. He says it's so that every mouth may be silenced. So what does that mean? Um, I, I knock on a lot of doors, and I try to talk to people about God. Right? I mean, that I believe our relationship with God is the most important thing. And the best thing I can do for someone is to help them think about their relationship with God and help them understand um, what God has done for them and who, who they are. That's why I love my job because I think it's the most important thing in the world. And I get to do that full time. But in those thousands and thousands of knocking on doors, um, a lot of times I, I get a chance to, to ask a question that kind of gets into this conversation. What does God mean to you, right? What, um, how do you stand with God? How do you view God? Um, and and one, of the, one of the ways that I, I get to that question is, is you know, asking the question, if you died tonight, where do you think you'd end up? You know, heaven or hell? I've asked that thousands, multiple thousands of times. Seven people have given me the answer, hell. Four of them said because they had murdered someone and, and you know they knew that that was too bad and, and thankfully I got to tell them you know what Jesus died even for that sin too but, but I'm getting off the subject so that means if seven people said they thought they were going to hell 3,412 or whatever the number is said some version of 
heaven, or I hope heaven, or I think heaven, or probably heaven, or maybe heaven, or certainly heaven. And then, then you follow that up and you ask them, why? If God said, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? You want to guess the number one answer? Any guesses? <laughs> pretty good. I've been pretty good, right? Some <laughs> version of, well, you know, I've never murdered anyone, or or I've been better than, you know, those people you see on TV, or or I try my hardest, right? Or, or you know, God knows my heart, and he knows that I'm trying, and, you know, I know I've done some bad things, but I, I try to do enough good things to, to make up for it, and, and um, what does this passage say about that? Stop talking. Stop talking. Right? Uh, the law says, I haven't been perfect. If I want to be with the holy God, I have to be holy, and, and I'm not. So what's the law there for? It's to tell me, shh, we got to know something. And, and then look at the next verse. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. The law isn't there so that we can get right with God. The law is there to show us we need help, right? Uh, rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. It shows us that we're a sinner. You know, so the problem with all people, we're all sinful. How do we see that? Well, I mean, boy, turn on the TV, look in the mirror, um, sin all around us. I put, you know, to clearly understand, read those verses with your name inserted. It's really easy to read passages of God's law and say, yeah, those people are really bad. But understand that law speaks to my own heart. I haven't been perfect either. Um, so so if you, if you look at the verdict of the law, we're going to talk about the law and the gospel and preach them. We're going to say, what's the verdict and what's the purpose? So verdict of the law, you're in the courtroom. What's the verdict? What does the law say? Guilty. I'm just kidding. Guilty, right? Stop <laughs> yeah. trying to defend yourself. Stop trying to make your excuses, right? Every mouth silence. Um, guilty. Yeah. So then why? You know, what's the purpose of the law? Why would God want to, to, you know, tell us we're guilty? Well, one, it shows us our sin. We just read Romans 3.20. Let's read Roman, read James 2.10. Uh, I have no idea who read last. It's your turn. Go ahead. For whoever keeps the whole law, the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. Think about that. Keep the whole law. Do everything so right. What's that? So basically the law was just there to remind us that we're all the same, that nobody is above the other. Okay. Yeah. God demands perfection. I'm not. You know, so I, I use the picture of trying to jump across the Grand Canyon. Um, if if I'm the best long jumper in the world, right? I mean, you saw some of those Olympic guys jumping, I don't remember, 20-some feet, um, just insane distances. If I trained and trained and trained and became the, the best long jumper in the world, and I, I sprinted and I hit the edge just perfectly and I launched myself, what happens? I'm going to fall and I'm going to die, right? There's no, I, I don't have it in me to jump the Grand Canyon. Um, now, if I have been sitting on the couch for the last two years eating potato chips and, and you know, whatever else, uh, and I, I roll off the couch and I, I, I you know, run as fast as I can, but you're kind of jogging up to the line and and, and jump into the Grand Canyon. Um, same thing, right? <laughs> same thing. Either way, that would same be me. because we don't have it in us. You know, and, and so for me to say, oh, hey, I'm way better than him. I'm still dead at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, right? It, it doesn't help any. Um, the law shows me, you know, like Lisa said, that I'm a sinner that I need help, right? Um, because God's serious about sin. I mean, all the passages about the punishment for sin, the wrath of God, it makes us realize our need for a Savior. Because by nature, we want to say, I'm not so bad. I think I can handle this. Um, and if I'm saying that, I'm not seeing the need. Um, I always use the picture of uh, you know going to the movies. I haven't been to the movies in a long time, but uh, I know it's a lot more expensive than it used to be. So I'll say, I'll say it's 13 bucks to go to the movies. I don't know if that's about right. Somewhere in there. Been a long time. Okay. Okay. Been a long time. <laughs> okay. Fifteen bucks. Fifteen bucks to go to the movies. Um, about thirteen bucks. And uh, and I, I, you know, I. I you don't want to get snacks and drinks. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm just saying to get in. I'm just saying to get in, right? So so I uh, pull up. I've got my wallet, and I've got you know thirty seven cents in my wallet, 
and uh, I, I'm going through the parking lot, and there's this guy there, and he's like, "Hey, I want to give you this. It's a it's a ticket for the movies." Um, and, and I'm like, "Yeah, whatever. This is probably some ad for something." I tear it up, I throw it in the garbage. I I walk in, and I go up to the the counter, and I'm like, "Yeah, I'd like you know, like to go to this movie." And and she's like, "Okay, fifteen dollars." And I put my thirty seven cents on the counter. What's going to happen? I'm not going to. Now, if I had the ticket that that man had gone in and bought and came out and gave to me, if I had the ticket, I'd, I'd be going in to see the movie. But I threw it out, right? Jesus has paid for all of our sin. It is bought and paid for. But if I'm walking in thinking, no, I got this. I'm not so bad. I don't need that. I, I'm not going to receive that, that gift that he's given. Um, so the law is there to say, hey, you need it. You need help here. Um, so I've got the question there. Can anyone make themselves right with God on their own? No. No, no. Um, we need the gospel. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, do to, to the bottom of the page here, because I don't want to leave you on that, uh, that uh, law note, because the law says we're in trouble, right? We deserve punishment. We deserve hell. Um, and so God comes with the gospel, which seems to contradict the law, um, but actually it fulfills it. it. It gives the answer for the law. Because uh, it is true that I deserve punishment, but look what else is true. God did something about that. So he had just said, no one is declared right, righteous in the sight by observing the law, rather through the law we become conscious of sin. But, a very big contrast here, but now a righteousness, so that thing that we couldn't achieve by our works, a righteousness from God, Apart from law, not our doing, it's been made known, it, it's revealed to us, to which the law and the prophets testify. So this is what the Bible has been all about, um, this righteousness that God has for us. This righteousness from God comes through faith, not through obedience, not through what I do. It comes through faith, through believing in Jesus Christ. So it comes through faith to all who believe. There's no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified, so, so there's a courtroom term, justify means to declare not guilty, right? The gavel comes down and the judge says not guilty. No matter what evidence was presented, the judge has declared us not guilty. So um, we're justified freely, notice not because we paid for it, freely by his grace, that's that gift word, um, that, that he gives it undeserved, freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So it's free, it's a gift, but it's not cheap. Redemption talks about the price that's paid. Right? And then what's the price? Well, the, the blood of Jesus, his sacrifice. So it's paid for, but it's free for us. Through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus, God presented him, Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement, that making us at one with God through faith in his blood. We get that atonement through faith. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. You know, David was a sinner. Abraham was a sinner. Adam and Eve were sinners. But when they died, they got to go to heaven. Even though Jesus hadn't paid for their sins yet. But of course, God isn't bound by time. He knows, you know, what has already happened in his time, right? So, so to us, it didn't look fair. But he was demonstrating his justice. So when Jesus died, it proved that he was right, that Jesus really did pay for sins. Um, he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just, right? He's fair and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So he he makes sure that that sin is paid for, um, and he gives us that not guilty verdict. So the, the questions there, you know, where do we find righteousness? Well, it's from God, right? He, he reveals it in his word. How does God bring that to me? Well, through faith, right? Um, it, it's the definition of justification, we talked about that. He declares us not guilty. How does God describe justification? Free, grace, and yet through the redemption, right? How about that next one? In what way does the cross show both God's justice and God's love? So justice meaning that, that uh, sin does not go unpunished. And love, how, how does it show both of those? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so the death, that's the wages of sin, right? At the cross, Jesus died. So our sins are, are paid for. 
that shows his justice, right? But but it also shows his love because it's not us. He loved us so much that he punished his son. Yeah. So let's read Romans 5, 18. And I warned you, I can never remember whose turn it is to read. It's Vicky's turn, all right. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. But just as, as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Okay. So the one trespass, of course, Adam and Eve sinned. The one act of righteousness, Jesus died on the cross, right? For all, for all. So how many were declared righteous? All. all. Right? So we talk about objective justification. So the, it's an objective truth that Jesus died to pay for the sins of all the world, to, to declare all of us not guilty. Um, on the next page, we'll talk about how, um, well, some people reject that, right? But uh, but it's objectively true. So you never have to worry if you're talking to someone, I wonder if their sins were paid for. Absolutely they were. Uh, you never have to worry if Satan's accusing you, saying, oh, God couldn't forgive that sin. Well, Jesus paid for that sin too. Um, so, if the verdict of the law is guilty, the verdict of the gospel? Not guilty. Right, right. Good. And we are out of time. Um, so, uh, uh, I'll close this with prayer. Any any questions or comments? Oh, What's that? Let's finish it. <laughs> oh, no, it's not up to me. I'm the late person. <laughs> but I was, I was going to say, if you want to stick around, Vicar will do the page you miss with you. you um, Lisa, Lisa, do you want to do you want to keep going, or, or should we? Because the first three chapters, I never get all the way through at one at a time. Um, because the next three are a little bit shorter, and we'll catch up. Um, does that work? So I actually got to be somewhere at twelve thirty. So. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I'll, I'll close this with prayer and then, uh, and then next week we'll, uh, 11 o'clock, we'll, we'll do this again. So Lord God, thank you for this time in your word and, and thank you for your gift of the gospel, your, your law to, to show us our need so that we appreciate the amazing grace that you've shown us in forgiving our sins. Um, bless us with the peace that that brings in Jesus name. Amen.